Thank you so much for joining us tonight. See, people are still coming in through the waiting room, but we're gonna we're gonna get started. We've got a lot to cover tonight. Um, thank you for joining us, first of all, for a new type of conversation. It wasn't long ago. It wasn't long ago that anyone affected by mastectomy didn't have the option of speaking um, about restoring sensation. So the mere fact that we are, are having this conversation is incredibly exciting. We know that cancer is not simply a physical or medical experience. And of course, some of the unintended side effects of medical decisions can impact our lives. Sharshara is here to help you address those concerns as well. Before I begin tonight, I have a few housekeeping items to share. First, tonight's program is presented in partnership, in partnership with Resensation, and we want to thank them for their generous support. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted on Charshera's website, along with the transcript for you to use as a resource. Participants' names and faces, of course, will not be in the video. You also have the option to be anonymous tonight during tonight's live webinar. You can turn your camera off and even change your name in your Zoom square. There are instructions in the chat box now on how to do that. We received a ton of questions through the registration process. As questions arise during tonight's presentation, please use the chat box and we will address them during the Q&A at the end of the webinar. As a reminder, Sharsherit has been providing telehealth services to the breast and ovarian cancer communities for more than 20 years. If you're interested in finding out more about Sharsherit's free, confidential, and personalized services, please email us or visit our website. You'll see our email address and our website in the chat box shortly. As we move into the webinar itself, I also want to remind you that Sharsherit is a national not-for-profit cancer support and education organization and does not provide any medical advice or perform any medical procedures. The information provided by Sharsherit and tonight's speakers is not a substitute for medical advice or treatment for a specific medical condition should not use this information to diagnose or treat health problems, and of course, always seek the advice of your physician or a qualified healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding your specific medical situation. We are so lucky to have with us tonight, Dr. Jonathan Bank. Dr. Bank is a board certified plastic surgeon with specialty training in microsurgery. He is, his areas of expertise include breast and body contouring with three a three-dimensional methodology, breast reconstruction, and reversal of lymphedema. A particular interest is of his is sens sensory restoration, of course, that's what we'll be speaking about primarily tonight, of the reconstructed breast, in which Dr. Bank has one of the longest standing experiences in America. He performs all aspects of facial, breast, and body cosmetic surgery in the New York area. Raised in New York and Israel, Dr. Bank graduated from the seven-year medical program at Tel Aviv University, served in elite military units in the Israeli Defense Force before relocating to Chicago, where he was a resident in plastic surgery at the University of Chicago Medical Center. Dr. Bank then completed a fellowship in microsurgical reconstruction at the University of Pennsylvania and the Fox Chase Cancer Center in Philadelphia. Dr. Bank is passionate about supporting and empowering women through their breast reconstruction journey and helping them reclaim their identities after treatment. He created Project Reconstructed to showcase an inspiring artistic approach to overcoming breast cancer. We're going to put that in the chat, the link to that in the chat box, um, in the chat box now. And I encourage you to take a look at it. And we'll actually put the link to that in a in the follow-up e-blast too, 
because it's beautiful work. And perhaps we'll have a chance to get to that a little more when we're in Q&A because some people did ask about that. But for now, I am excited to introduce you to Dr. Bank. Dr. Bank, the screen is yours. Thank you, Melissa. And thank you everybody for showing up today. I see a lot of uh, familiar faces and names. And uh, especially thank you to Jocelyn for joining us today. And we're gonna talk about her story and let her have the, the stage a little bit later on. I'm gonna share my screen right now. And I particularly appreciate getting through that uh, wordy introduction. So I know that's a lot of the... Oh, that was uh, a great introduction. It was. So. Okay, so my name is Jonathan Bank. I'm a plastic surgeon with a group of uh, uh, four other plastic surgeons. We all focus on the same things. Uh, mainly breast reconstruction and aesthetic surgery. I'm just gonna gloss over aesthetic surgery for a second, but to us, it's one and the same. In this day and age, we don't wanna just uh, reconstruct a breast. We wanna reconstruct something that is beautiful and uh, not just uh, for appearances, but also for how one feels about themselves. And um, whenever I talk about breast reconstruction, I always go over all the options that women have. Uh, option number one, we used to call it no reconstruction, but in the last couple of years, we've been calling it aesthetic flat closure because it's a procedure in and of itself. It's a choice that women can make. A breast doesn't define who a woman is as a person, and uh, various women choose to do um, the types of reconstruction, including aesthetic flat, flat closure, and we support that and perform those procedures as well. And uh, it's not just an esoteric thing. It was on the cover of the well section of the New York Times several years ago. And I was bringing this up with this beautiful, proud lady um, and her choice. And um, I also continue to talk about a lady that came to me that chose to have that. And um, a couple of years after her original mastectomy, where she just wanted to deal with getting rid of the cancer and not uh, doing a formal uh, full breast restoration at that point, she came to me and uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about her, but I just want you to keep that image in mind for a second. So another front page in the New York Times, maybe four or so years ago, I mean, four or five years ago, uh, really the, the first discussion that I'm aware of in the popular literature or the popular uh, media talking about numbness after uh, mastectomy. So the article went in depth into um, not just the uh, emotional components of having facing a mastectomy, having to make that choice, but also some sequelae that may not have been discussed uh, as much until this article. And um, it was an interest of mine before this actually came out. And uh, it, it's just really expanded across the country and beyond uh, to really a, a, a main part of the discussion, the consultation that we um, educate our patients when uh, they're faced with making that such of a, cho a choice. And it's beyond just the anecdotal, somebody got burned because they didn't feel the, the breast uh, skin, their, their main there, there are many, many other components, uh, physical and emotional, that uh, are really become a, a true interest of mine and a focus in my practice. I'm going to go up to the basic anatomy that have to do with the nerves of the breast and chest. So there are multiple nerves that's, that provide sensation to the breast and chest area. And uh, you can think of them as coming, emerging through uh, the interspaces between the ribs. So they kind of wrap around almost like uh, a belt for that part of the body. And they, um, they look like little wet spaghetti. Some are thicker, some are uh, thinner, like uh, maybe other uh, finer pastas. And some are emerging in other portions of the body, such as in the uh, infraclavicular area, right underneath the collarbone and in the armpit area. And those are ones that are, particularly in the armpit area, affected by things like having a sentinel lymph node biopsy or an axillary lymph node dissection. Uh, but these nerves that run to the breast skin and the nipple areola complex are at risk of being injured during a mastectomy. And that's a discussion that needs to take place um, before somebody is going into having this procedure done. 
And when I started practice, I, um, you know, from these reconstructions, I'd be happy with the appearance of things, but there were still complaints that uh, that arose, and I think a lot of them were related to um, injuring those nerves as uh, as as part of the extirpative procedure. Um, a quick overview of the different types of reconstruction we touched up about aesthetic flat closure. And this is just an illustration uh, about uh, implant-based reconstruction, in this case through an inframammary incision underneath the breast fold. Uh, we use a sheet of dermal matrix to cradle the implant, hold it in place. And you can have a nice uh, outcome with a concealed scar and um, I guess pre and post or mid COVID and you know, other types of incisions and modifications of those procedures. Um, an area that I focus on that began sort of my interest in the nerve reconstruction is what we call natural tissue reconstruction, the various flaps. This is an example of a deep flap or a DIP flap where we take tissue from the lower abdomen and we transplant it to the chest, same kind of incision, for instance, in this case, and the tissue is transplanted to the chest. And the way it stays alive is by connecting blood vessels and artery and a vein that keep the blood flowing in and out. Uh, and then the donor site, there's a scar somewhere in the belly or other parts uh, um, uh, of where we're taking the tissue from. So, you know, an example of this and, uh, and, and additional examples of various stages of uh, a woman that had these types of reconstructions. Now, back to this lady that um, initially elected to have an aesthetic flat closure, and then came to me a couple of years later saying, you know what, I'm just not happy with uh, the appearance of my body. What, what can you do? And we did. Um, the uh, the deep flaps or transplanted tissue from her lower abdomen in several stages. Uh, we had to bring skin from the lower belly. So there's some disadvantages to doing a delayed reconstruction, but it's definitely possible. Now, to me, this is an acceptable outcome, but it almost doesn't matter. Uh, to me, this is what matters. Go going from this upside down frown to this upside down smiley face. And here we did not just uh, natural tissue reconstruction, natural smile reconstruction, natural self-confidence and self-esteem reconstruction. To me, this is really um, primary in what we do in plastic surgery. And uh, this is my goal. So uh, just a, a quick side note, uh, we do these little art projects. This one is called Before the After. Marie, uh, Mary started this with these uh, accidental pictures. And then I went back and got a series of a couple dozen of women that had breast uh, reconstruction for cancer prevention and caught little glimpses when I was taking their after shots uh, in our sterile photo room, but we captured what really matters, little glimpses of emotion. And those smiles is really what we're trying to get to and not, uh, you know, the body's important, but I think uh, the soul and how you feel in that body is, there's no comparison to the importance of that. So um, we did this, uh, well, we published a book about a year, year and change ago. Um, with Canon, all benefiting the American Cancer Society. And uh, books are available, still for sale. And to me, it's always, the projects are always a failure unless we sell out the books. So we need help with that with this one, but we're, get, we're getting it. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, but beyond the, just the, the little snapshots, there's real science behind why reconstruction. And there are many, many studies showing that um, mood disorders, depression after a mastectomy are a real thing that, you know, contributes to um, a whole host of uh, being, in some instances, withdrawn from society and just not feeling comfortable in one's body. And that's why, in, even back in 1998, the Women's Health and Cancer Rights Act uh, basically enacted it in, into law. Now, again, uh, reconstruction is one thing, but how you feel is another. And I think that, um, like we said earlier on, how you feel relates to nerves sometimes, and sometimes those nerves are cut during a mastectomy. And there are ways to, uh, to deal with that. Now, a lot of this um, initial data came from uh, nerves elsewhere in the body, such as in the hands, the legs, anywhere outside of the brain, and spinal cord nerves want to sprout back. So we need to give them an option to sprout back. And they will grow back at about a millimeter a day, if all things being even. This is an example of a mastectomy, not a uh, nipple sparing, but a uh, skin sparing mastectomy, where the nerve, the bystander nerve to the nipple had to be cut. Um, in this case, 
we took tissue again from the abdomen, the deep flaps, doing both sides, not just the one side like I showed earlier. And here we not just harvest the blood vessels in conjunction with the flap where the tissue, the, the skin and fat from the lower belly, but we also take the nerves that run just like they do to the breast. They run in every segment of your body. That's why there is sensation there. So the nerves that go to the lower abdomen are also cut in this case, and they're harvested and they're reconnected to uh, what we call a nerve graft, which you can think of it as a, like a jumper cable. Okay, so we connect the blood vessels directly, usually, and then after the blood vessel connections are made, we'll connect a nerve, one that was cut and because it went to the breast that had to be removed, we connect it to a nerve that comes with the uh, this the tissue from the abdomen in this instance. And we can expect over time, if everything is uh, done appropriately, uh, for those nerves to grow back. Uh, there are all kinds of uh, factors that may make this more difficult. Uh, I think people that have had radiation, people that are diabetic, smokers, um, and maybe an age uh, plays a uh, factor as well. The nerves may take longer to grow back, may not grow back at all. Uh, but this is just one example of a woman that had bilateral mastectomies and uh, reconstruction. And I just want you to focus on uh, a little snippet of a video uh, here. Deep you hear this? Flap, uh, reconstruction, okay. February 1st. Now we're end of July. July 29th, 2020. Do anything here? No. So a few months after, yes. she feels something think? over there, but not in that central okay. part. Yes. And later on, this yes. is about a year later. Pin. She can feel uh, she can feel a pinprick right in that spot in the center of the breast. That tissue came from the belly, so it's it wasn't connected to the breast to begin with. And uh, almost a year later, it took, uh, but the nerves regrew, and there's no other explanation for how those nerves. Uh, or how the sensation came about to be other than the connection here. And this example is even more demonstrative in my eyes. So this lady, you can tell from the longer scar over here, had a delayed type of reconstruction. The patch of skin that you see in the lower half of her breast is skin from her lower abdomen. This is a reconstructed nipple with an areola tattoo. And I connected a nerve in the outer part of her chest, what we call the lateral part of her chest, that travel towards the lower lateral or outer part of her areola. So this entire patch of skin from in her lower breast is connected to a nerve that is then connected to her spinal cord in her brain. And if you pay attention, she's a bit more soft-spoken. That is, that's actually strong. That's, um medium it's her natural um, skin like, so some sensation superior. came back mm -hmm. from a mastectomy yeah, the area. yeah i can't see it anywhere with the nails wow. um, superior lateral and that's more lateral i'm watching a webinar on uh and that feels to me like the edge of the areola laterally. So she's saying that she's feeling that at the edge of her areola laterally, even though I'm touching on the inner or lower part, she feels, and that basically tells me that that the only nerve that I connected is the lateral one, the outer one. So to me, there's no doubt that there's some debate, you know, can nerves sprout through the scar and so on? Yeah, potentially. But the fact that she's feeling it on the, this entire lower portion and she's feeling it on the outer part, that's where her brain says that it is is to me very convincing that this uh, this actually works. So there, there have been multiple studies and there's a growing body of uh, studies in, in our main literature. There's actually a study from uh, Europe where um, they basically compared women that had no re no inner no reinnervation and reinnervation uh, flaps. This is just to show you the statistical st significance, I remember uh, the the surgeon that was presenting this at a conference a couple of years ago, I came up to her afterwards and congratulated her. And she said she was almost embarrassed to show these results because it's almost unbelievable. The The improvement is so statistically significant. It's almost, uh, there's almost no reason not to do that. And then um, there are additional other uh, studies that uh, also look at, again, what's important, the quality of life is higher in uh, the people that had 
uh, the women that had uh, sensory restoration. So apropos the depression, maybe we're getting to better quality of life and uh, with doing these procedures. <clears throat> now, the flip side of this coin is what happens to the nerves that you don't reconstruct? Like I said, nerves want to sprout back. They're like little electric cables that want to uh, grow back and, and submit signals to and from the brain, uh, really with sensory to the brain. But what happens if those nerves are cut and nothing is done with them? It's almost like live wires. Many women complain of uh, these electrical shooting pains. It's a very common complaint in these very reproducible locations in the armpit area, in the outer part of the chest, sometimes in the inner part of the chest. And I know that's where those nerves run. Those are the ones that I reconstruct. Uh, the problem is, uh, if you don't address them in surgery, there's a chance that's not, not zero, that you're, there's going to be some sort of a problem with those nerves trying to re-sprout, and they can't. So this is one of the uh, earlier ones that I dealt with, with pain issues. Here, I just had, my, I'm having my post-op appointment. I had a toe flap. Um, prior to the surgery, I had had a uh, reconstruction already with breast implants placed. And I had a persistent pain to the left side of my breast. And I tried to address it with previous surgeons. And um, they just said, you know, give it time. It'll go away. Kind of brushed me off. Um, and then uh, I came looking, searching for another breast surgeon. And um, told him about this pain that I was experiencing. And it was persistent pain. It was 24-7. Um, if I had a rough day at work and was more physical, the pain got worse. I showed him exactly where it was prior to the surgery. And on a physical exam, we located the area of maximal tenderness on the outer side of her left breast. This correlates to where the major nerves to the breast lie. During surgery, we removed an implant that was used for a previous reconstruction, and we located an area of cut nerves. that were occluded by a metal clip that was placed in order to stop bleeding from blood vessels right next to the nerve. At this point, we dissected the nerve that we identified with the clip. We removed the clip and separately occluded the blood vessels to prevent bleeding. After freeing up the nerve, we took tissue from her inner thigh along with the blood vessels and transplant them to the chest area to reconstruct the breast. This is known as the tug flap. In addition to the blood vessels, we also connected a nerve using a nerve connector. And this restored normal nerve function from the cut nerve to the nerve that was transferred with tissue from the thigh. We did the same procedure on the right side. And later she went on to complete her reconstruction. At this point at my post-op, that particular pain is gone. Yes, I have tenderness from the surgery itself, but that pain that I was feeling is gone. So this post mastectomy pain, it's uh, there have been a few studies from across the, the globe that all have fairly consistent uh, results. There are studies from Denmark, China, Brazil, and a recent one, this one from uh, University of Michigan, uh, talking about post mastectomy pain. And you know, the studies range from 500 to about 5,000 participants. So it's, uh, there's good stati statistics over here. And um, post mastectomy pain can occur in up to 20 to 50% of women, according to these uh, studies. And you can subdivide them into severity and the really severe ones that require chronic um, pain medications or various interventions, fortunately, are um, probably only around 8 to 10%, which is not an insignificant number. Um, and that case that I just illustrated really sort of brought to my uh, immediate attention that you know, this is something that we can actually do something about. And the extent of it 
is uh, not something to be overlooked. As I was taught, so it's in training, no, it's just the nerves going back and growing back. I know that they, they won't sometimes because if they're cut or stuck and stuck and scar, uh, or if the other things sort of occluding their regrowth, it's a problem. So uh, we actually uh, wrote about our approach to post breast surgery pain syndrome because it's actually not unique only to uh, post mastectomies. Any women that, uh, or even men that have uh, surgery on the breast or chest, if those nerves are affected, uh, there can be a real problem. We've dealt with uh, other uh, cases. This is just to show, uh, I know you can't read this, but it's just our uh, algorithm to how to approach this, uh, this issue. And it's a multi-pronged approach that starts uh, with a physical therapist, a pain specialist. What an and at the end of the day, uh, if, we, if it comes to it, we may have to do surgery. So we call this effort breast relief. Uh, for obvious reasons, and one in eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer in their lifetime. There are almost three million women in America that have been touched by that disease. Mm. About forty percent of them have had a mastectomy, and a significant number of developed post mastectomy pain syndrome. Breast relief mm. aims to address this problem, combining physical therapy, pain management, mutual anesthesia, and reparative surgery when needed. Jen tells her story best. Five years ago when I started this, right, from my first surgery, I knew that there was something different. I couldn't put my fingers on it. I've been in physical therapy for five years. And every time I would raise my arm, I would get this incredible heat, numbness. The pain would start all in here. I just figured it was healing all in here. I would be able to touch a spot over here that would send me through the roof. I got to feel it. Right here. And then your muscles start switching just when you start touching it. Yeah, as soon as I start pressing in because it hurts. During surgery, we temporarily moved her reconstruction implant and then we were able to identify a nerve that was cut and trapped in scar, perfectly corresponding to the tender spot on her skin. We repaired the nerve and replaced the implant. I don't feel like two separate people. I used to say that my left side, I was one person, my right side, I was a different. And I don't feel like that. And it's crazy because I really didn't believe that that could really happen. And it did. Oh my God, I could not. I'm a hairdresser. I own a hair salon. My arms are my life. I could not raise my arms like this without them falling asleep. It was, they would fall asleep, they would be numb. The, the pain would radiate all in here. I go home with a, with ice packs and heat. And now I can raise my arms fully up. I can do all my haircuts. My haircuts, I was booking one an hour, maybe three or four times a week. Now I'm booking them every hour daily. Okay, so this is Jen week three, doing a long layer haircut that she has not been able to do in years. She's able to extend her arms up and cut. Without numbness, without pain. Oh, no. Definitely one of the most rewarding parts of our practice. So this uh, article, so you know, I, I've been talking about this for some time now, and it's wonderful to see when you go to the various uh, conferences, more and more people talking about this, more people practicing it. And I think a lot of it, again, was driven by um, popular media and even more by women in the community that advocate for uh, a change, okay? this We have a problem, let's fix it together as a community. And I think conversations like this continue to raise awareness and, and basically force us professionals to, uh, to continue to push the needle to, to do best. So this is a paper literally from last week, uh, again, in our one of our main journals. Uh, one of the authors here used to be uh, my medical student and a resident um, all the way across the country in Arizona. Um, it's basically just a viewpoint talking about the things that I just talked now, uh, saying that we can do neurotization or uh, restoring uh, sensation, or at least attempting to during breast reconstruction. There's no guarantees, but the downsides are minimal. And they talk about how in profession hands, it really doesn't add time, which was one of the original concerns uh, for the naysayers. Um, 
and th I think there's really no downside. And if you can avoid having a live electric wire, not uh, just uh, uh, being free and loose and causing problems, you can restore some kind of connection. And with the hopes of it uh, restoring sensation, I think you're at least avoiding the chance of having chronic pain. If there is chronic pain issues, we, uh, for the most part, know how to deal with it. Um, and may not always be a surgical solution, but it's part of the multi-pronged approach, multidisciplinary approach, approach to it. And uh, so it's great to see other people uh, talking about this now and uh, forums like this that help spread the word and say, go back to your doctor and say, uh, um, hey, help me. Now, I'd like to introduce a uh, dear friend of mine, uh, Jocelyn. This this was the best picture I could find of her. They're not, you know, pretty hard to find, but um, this is uh, one that my dear friend Eris Sabag uh, took. Um, was it like three, almost three years now? About two years now. Um, that uh, she's part of a project we call Restored, uh, where we cast women in various stages of reconstruction. Jocelyn happened to see uh, an earlier project I did uh, called Reconstructed, where um, we kind of play on the Japanese art form of kintsugi, which takes broken pottery and regales the pieces with a cracks lined in gold to show that something that's been through some sort of adversity can be beautiful or even more so because uh, of what it went through. So uh, in Jocelyn's part of the project of Restored, where we cast her, we cast her in, uh, in gold, and not just because of uh, who she is, but because of kind of uh, how she came to uh, work with us. So this is a little bit of Jocelyn's technical story, and I'll tell her. Jocelyn she'll tell her bilateral mastectomy for incisions above her nipple areola compasses. This is to story the areolas and lift them in a second stage. She elected to remove the nipples themselves to reduce the risk of cancer because of her genetic tendency. At the time of the mastectomies, we reconstructed the breasts using tissue from her lower abdomen and the deep flaps. We reconnected the blood vessels to keep the tissue alive and reconnect the nerves to help regain sensation. At a second stage, a few months later, we liposuctioned the torso to improve her contour, lifted the areolas, and tightened the breast skin. We also recreated her nipples by doing a little origami of her areolar skin, which gives a natural nipple appearance. Jocelyn was touched by our old art project titled Reconstructed, inspired by the Japanese art of Kintsugi, in which gold is used to embrace the scars of overcoming adversity. In this project, Restored, we cast Jocelyn over the stages of her reconstruction and recreated a golden statue of her beautiful torso. So I'm going to hand it over to Jocelyn now. Uh, Hi. Nice to meet everyone on this call. Thank you, Dr. Bank, Dr. B, as I like to call him. Um, so blessed to be here. So my surgery was actually two years ago, October, October, I think it was October 27th to be exact or around that time. Um, you know, it didn't really actually hit me till now, the last few weeks, actually, my two year anniversary, I, I felt very overwhelmed that week. And I was like, hmm. And my mom said to me, happy anniversary. I'm like, oh, that's why I feel, you know, it's an emotional it's an emotional journey for sure. Um, so I um, I guess we'll start with my story of how I found Dr. Bank and kind of how this all came to be and why I'm here tonight. Um, back in June of 2020, beginning of the pandemic, really a few months into the pandemic, I live in Long Island, there was no reprieve, but you could go to the beach, right? The beach was open, it was wide open space. And I was actually uh, sitting on the beach with a friend of mine who actually uh, is a metastatic breast cancer survivor. And I had mentioned to her, just in casual talking, you know, we're maintaining our distance six feet apart and just kind of shouting at each other. Like, you know, my mom called me, I wanted to ask you about something. My mom called me and said her levels were elevated for something called BRCA. And my friend's like, you know, the look she gave me was like, what do you mean levels are elevated? It's black and white. You either have it or you don't. You either have the BRCA mutation or you don't. So BRCA mutation is a breast cancer mutation. You're more genetically disposed to, um, I guess, co contracting breast cancer, ovarian cancer, and other forms of cancer based on your genetic uh, composition. And so my mom likes to, uh, you know, paint a pretty picture of everything. <laughs> so she made it, you know, like no big deal. And my friend was like, oh, this is a big deal. You should really look deeper into this. So this is probably June. And, you know, over the course of the next few weeks, I just started researching and, and doing some homework. 
I'm sure a bunch of you on this call have done the same thing. Go on Facebook, you know, you start Googling or maybe you don't. Um, but I am, I'm a geek at, at heart and I was just going deep into the research. Um, during that time, you know, I started getting consultations, seeing breast surgeon, a breast surgeon at the time who sent me, uh, when you have the BRCA mutation, they send you for more advanced screenings. So I did uh, my my mammo, I did breast sonogram, and then I went for an MRI. Um, it was in the MRI that they actually found early ductal carcinoma in situ. So cancerous cells that haven't quite spread into the breast yet. They may, they may not. Um, so at that time, I knew that I, the doctors recommended I receive a double mastectomy as a course of treatment, just because of the likelihood of me, you know, getting future cancer cells coming back. Anyway, so in my research, I had read, you know, I heard the term, you know, resensation just in my, my, my nerding out on my couch at night and I, but it didn't really resonate until the, I heard about the DCIS. So I went through this course of action. I scheduled a surgery with one surgeon and then my gut was kind of screaming at me. I'm like, no, let me go back and do a little more digging. So I don't know. I think it was like a Friday night on my couch. I started back in the Facebook world of research. And I was like, let me, what was it? Resensation. So I, I, I Googled it. I came across, you know, I had read about Dr. Bank in these chats and then I looked up the resensation website. Um, so kind of twofold. I saw, Don, I work in the beauty industry. I love beauty. I love women. I love empowerment. And something struck me about Dr. Bank, and that was his project that he mentioned, uh, Reconstructed, where he basically took what's a very traumatic experience and turned it into a beautiful art form. So for me, it was like, oh, I remember calling my friend. I'm like, this is my guy. I found my guy. And she's like, what are you talking about? Like, calm down. Um, and then I then looked up Resensation around the same time that night, probably the same night, and he was one of the doctors listed as uh, having practiced this technique, which was also important to me because my friend who was the one that kind of alerted me to the, you know, significance of BRCA, you know, she had had a mastectomy, she had reconstruction, and one thing she said to me, I miss, you know, the feeling of the warmth of hugging my children, you know, I, part of my reconstruction is I have no sensation in my breasts, and um, I don't know, I just, I called Dr. Banks' office that Monday, I think I was in that same week uh, when I met him. He go, he went through all these videos like he showed you tonight. And it was just really moving to know the options. And, and the reason I'm here tonight is because I feel it's very important to pay it forward and to just speak about the journey and share with others that there are options out there in terms of reconstruction. And the significance of going through something like this can have a really beautiful outlook. Um, so a few months after my reconstruction, my mastectomy and reconstruction, I did deep black reconstruction with Dr. Bank. Um, I participated in his next series, Restored, um, and that's where you saw me in my golden torso. But as related to resensation, I, uh, I I actually don't even know, to be honest with you, Dr. B, like where you grafted. I know I, you know, you kind of blank things out, but I do know that. I have sensation and I have nothing else to compare it to, meaning I don't know what it's like to not have sensation at all. There are definitely spots in my breasts where I do not have sensation, but you know, if I, if I put my hands here, I could actually feel, you know, the ache or the feeling that I'm touching myself. I, you know, um, so I would have to believe in it working because I haven't lost sensation. So um, that's my story in a nutshell and really blessed to be here tonight. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much for, for sharing your story, Jocelyn. Dr. Bank, we have a lot of Q&A. Do you have more to share before we go into that? We, no, no we're I'm, good, okay. Ready for this question. Okay, amazing. So I'm going to keep us all on spotlight here because there may be questions for, for both of you. Um, but I do want to say that this is a complicated topic. So much about breast cancer is, and it really does help to hear somebody's story. 
So thank you. It allows us to sort of process it in a different way. So thank you. Okay. We got, this may have been a record on the number of questions we've gotten um, for webinars, um, but I think that the, the most common question in many different forms is, I've already had my surgeries, and is it, is it still possible for me? Now, I want you to know that those questions came from people with deep flaps, with lap flaps, with with uh, straight to aesthetic flat closure with to implant surgeries. So the question is, once somebody's completed this, if they want to reverse course, so to speak, is it possible? And is there what are the somebody just asked in the in the thing? I'm two and a year, half years past. Is it too late for me? So let's start there. That that's an excellent question that I you know get asked a lot, and the bottom line is potentially but unlikely. Now, the the reason being is that the the, the why potentially yes is as follows: the nerves that are cut, there's still roots of those nerves somewhere, and. If you know the anatomy and you know where to look for them, you can find them. The question is how sort of lively are those roots and how how can they what is their capacity to resprout and to what extent will they resprout and where are they going to resprout to? So I've definitely have had experiences mainly in women that had prior implant-based reconstruction underneath the chest muscle. That we've then converted to what we call a uh, prepectoral reconstruction or above the muscle reconstruction. And um, I've had anecdotes where we didn't really do any nerve work and all of a sudden the uh, sensation came back somehow. And I think that has to do with just stretching the nerves and stretching the muscle and potentially that uh, inhibits nerve growth, as you can, uh, I think, imagine. Um, and we have had instances where we found those nerves and reconnected them. And it, it's mainly been in the pain setting. So like you saw in those examples, then the, the pain is uh, a lot of the times reversed, but um, the sensation returns to a much more variable degree. In instances where we had implant reconstructions or aesthetic flat closures that we then converted to deep flaps or tug flaps and, and basically brought new tissue that has its own uh, natural nerve supply and we could reconnect and we connected those nerves to the stumps of the nerves that were previously cut. Now the nerves have to grow just a relative short distance in order to re-innervate swaths of skin that came with um, viable branches of, uh, of, of nerves that were working. So we've definitely seen success with that, like uh, similar to what we saw with that, that pat, those two patch examples in the beginning. Now, um, if uh, it's more complex, if somebody already had a major reconstruction, like a deep flap or a, a lat flap, a latissimus flap that's uh, with uh, skin and fat and, and muscle from the back, then it's, uh, it's a more challenging undertaking. And I would say that the likelihood of restoring sensation there is decreased because a lot of times, again, the skin is already there, already has its nerve connections and the best that we can do, and we've tried it. And I think we're still a little bit waiting for nerves to grow back because we're not that far in our experience with delayed nerve implantation and to just point it to some direction and hope it grows. We do that plenty uh, for nerve pain issues. And we're seeing, still waiting to see if those nerves will actually grow the entire distance to provide sensation to a meaningful location. But, but when you do it in, for, for pain, surrounding pain concerns, even if the nerves take a long time or, or, op, or in the end don't make those connections, the pain is diminished. So. Oh yes, that's, yeah, uh, yes. that's it. so it, it's akin to having an amputation of 
uh, let's say your leg. My uh, close friend of mine, who was my co-resident during uh, during residency at University of Chicago, went and focused on hand surgery and uh, and peripheral nerve surgery, and he has one of the largest experiences now of uh, uh, reconstruct or managing nerves during the time of an amputation. Let's say somebody has to, he, he works in the DC area, and uh, if somebody has to have uh, there's a large limb center there, so people that have to have amputations. He will go and preventatively not just wait for a stump phantom pain to occur, which is extremely debilitating. People can't wear prostheses and so on. Not much different than the breast. The nerves are much larger in, in the leg and so on. But what he will do is reconnect those nerves and connect them to something to hope that they sprout and, and avoid having that live wire. Uh, he actually just uh, was awarded like the best paper in uh, our main journal. I'm very proud of him uh, just this past month in, in one of the conferences. And we talk a lot about these things because there's a lot of overlap. You know, the body is uh, the, it's For made sure. up of the same basic materials. So uh, it doesn't matter okay. where the I, I want to, I just want to clarify for, for the people on here. It sounds that like the longer one waits, the more difficult it will be and, and the less likely for the nerves to, to regenerate. But it's possible, particularly, it sounds like implant with implant under the muscle or with aesthetic plaque closure, almost even a little more likely than with a flap surgery. Is that and, what you said? Okay. Then prior flap, yeah, I think right. so. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Um, I also kind of got the sense when you were talking and when we spoke in preparation for this, that, um, you know, you indicate it happens a lot when there's pain involved. You had said to me something in passing the last time we spoke where, where going in just to restore the nerves is something a little post, you know, post a mastectomy is something that doctors are a little less likely to do. But if there's another issue to go in, then it makes more sense to try it while you're already, uh, you know, there, basically. Is that that's kind of the attitude these days? Um, not in my practice. Okay. <laughs> um, I misunderstood that. I'm glad I asked and we clarified so, that. Look, it's frequently there's a combination of things. You know, uh, if somebody had a mastectomy or reconstruction, um, uh, a lot of us know that it's it's a process. It can take multiple steps. We evolve as our bodies evolve with time and you know we can always use some refinements if we choose to do so and if there's a nerve issue at that time then yeah it definitely makes sense but i've operated on women that that's the only complaint um but so it's it's kind of become the reverse i'm having surgery because i ex exhausted all of the non-surgical options to deal with my pain please operate on me to try to help with the pain and while you're at it can you also do x y and so right. that's that's uh, kind of like the the opposite of um, maybe how I started this. Say, so, okay, well, you know, we got to fix that, and you know what? I'll take a look and see if maybe I can do a nerve thing now because of uh, the experience uh, that our practice has with uh, these types of things. It's I, I feel more and more confident that I can locate the areas that we're targeting, and we've uh, developed ways again by adapting. And, and taking from other uh, components of plastic surgery and, uh, and we'll do these things with a decent success rate. Thank you. Okay, so um, another question we receive from several people is, when having a mastectomy, nipple sparing versus not nipple sparing, does that impact the ability to do this? Okay, so if there is no nipple, then by definition, the, the nerve endings to the nipple are not going to be there so we're going to try to do the next best thing in jocelyn's case because the nipple harbors the ducts that uh, have the cells that have the propensity to become cancerous we choose to remove the nipple we preserve the areola a lot of times the areola nerves can be preserved and they're quite similar to ones uh, of the nipple so the reconstructed nipple from the areola skin uh, can be similar to uh, natural nipple sensation. Uh, let me just backtrack a second. Um, well, many, maybe many seconds to before a woman develops breast buds, the nerves were there, the nipple was there. As one goes through puberty, 
the breast bud grows from behind the nipple and the areola and basically displaces the skin kind of like being pregnant you still have sensation or it, it just displaces and stretches out this the skin and the blood vessels and the nerves that go there so what i'm trying to say is that the the breast basically pushes the nerves away and the breast is to a certain degree independent from a lot of the nerves that i showed in that first illustration there are nerves that go directly into the breast parenchyma into the breast tissue that's how the brain communicates with the breast and, and tells it to grow in the first place and tells it to produce uh, milk when it's time and uh, so on so some of those are going to be cut but a lot of the nerves can be preserved when you're removing the breast tissue if you're working with a a, a breast surgeon that is cognizant of uh, that subtle anatomic um, nuance and can identify and say okay the nerves are going to be in these areas let's preserve them and that's what uh our practice has evolved to really working hand in hand with the breast surgeons the ones that are open to listening uh and really do the mastectomy in concert so say you know watch out these are the areas that we're gonna or you know this patient came to me because she wants that so let's be extra careful but you know now they're really trying to educate uh the breast surgeons out there and, and working together with them to improve the the outcome so both for nipple sparing mastectomies and for skin sparing mastectomies i think a lot of the nerves can be preserved they're ones that just can't because we need to get in there somehow we need to remove some tissue and those are the ones that we reconstruct okay. um Thank may you. i chime in really quickly one thing i want to um mention is my first experience with my first breast surgeon obviously everyone's going to have a different experience my surgeon at the time when I asked about resensation before I even met Dr. Bank was that doesn't work. Um, and I was like, well, something has, like, why would they be doing this if it doesn't work? Like, why not try, yeah. you know? And for me, it was very important to try, like, why not try? And it's not right for everyone and not everyone has the opportunity. Um, but that's kind of why I feel it's important to share that you are informed in your choices. And, you know, if you have Absolutely. the opportunity, it's worth a shot. Okay, thank you. That's very helpful. There are a couple of people asked if, if um, there are alternatives to restoring sensation other than, than surgical. For instance, you know, they've had, they've had their surgeries done. That's behind them. Is there anything they can do other than going under the knife again to get some feeling back? That's a really good question. And the only thing that I can point to is there's studies with nerve loss in other parts of the body that the, the, bo the body has some plasticity to it. The nerves, like I said, can sprout back. And there is a school of thought that says that the nerves can sort of jump from where they, what we call them dermatomes or parts of the skin that the specific branches of nerves innervate and there is some overlap between those nerves so let's say one nerve was cut the other one may be able to compensate for it and i think the best way or the only way that i really know that uh is a potential option for that is uh, a, a kind of a biofeedback sort of really touch giving the nerve some kind of a target to grow to so basically tactile stimulation of various types um is the only option, but uh, I, I don't think that we have a complete answer for that. You know, it's uh, so that's the only thing that I can try, but I, I don't think that there's some magical treatment. No, for no, if there was, clearly that would have been out there well, you know, before already. So, okay, a couple qu other questions that are a little simpler. Um, is this often covered by insurance or is this an out of pocket surgery or addition to the surgery? Most insurance carriers that we work with cover it. Um, there are some that um, still consider it experimental for reasons that are beyond my understanding at this point. Um, so it, in my mind, it's not experimental. We've been reconnecting nerves almost as long as uh, plastic surgery has existed. And the rest is part of the body just like anyone else, like any other part uh so it's not an out-of-pocket thing unless there's a specific insurance hurdle 
Okay, so most do. What percentage of surgeries that you do actually are successful? And I mean, the smile said everything, but can you give us a number um, as to, you know, get people to understand what their, what the, the, what the chances are for yes, the chances. Uh, exactly. So that article that I pointed out was uh, yeah, probably the best, um, the best one out there to, to show the numbers. And, you know, we're talking and I think uh, a good, a good estimate would be probably around 80% having a, a, a good amount of sensation which uh, I don't think that that's true for all portions of the breast, depending on how the mastectomy was done. You know, if we choose to do it through an incision underneath the breast fold, then more areas in the lower part of the, the breast are at risk and probably have a lower uh, chance of growing back. But the remaining nerves that are there are have a high chance of uh, basically not being too badly affected. So, you know, in those instances, we see women describe sensation, feel like, oh, I feel like we're probably 90, 95% normal. That's amazing. A couple of people asked, is this a procedure that can be done with women living with metastatic disease? Yeah, if, uh, if the disease is under control, unfortunately, good, good science has brought us to this. A phase where women are living uh, with breast cancer many, many years. Um, there, there's certain medical considerations that need to be managed during um, some of these operations. Uh, but I've done breast reconstruction on women with uh, metastatic disease, and um, you know, if you manage the risks appropriately, you can do it safely. So. It's never a uh, non-starter. But I think at this point, it would be just a good reminder. I mentioned at the beginning, like every single person has different circumstances surrounding. And so what Dr. Bank is talking about today are generalities. And of course, you're, you know, you have to speak to someone, a, a healthcare provider, right? Your own specific medical situation, including personal risks and, and medical situation and things like that. So that's, that's a strong reminder. Let's do um, two quick questions. First of all, um, in terms of where one can find a provider that does that, not just in the United States, but around the world, is there a website one could go to to find doctors who can perform this? There was a question specifically about Asia, but I know the question is lingering in lots of people's minds right now. Yeah, so the recent station website, recentstation.com, it's uh, there's a surgeon locator, and you basically Perfect. put it in the state and uh, and and find somebody that's in your region and. Uh, you know, there are more and more people across the country and across the world that are doing these operations, and some of them are extremely proficient. So, uh, you just so can we get that? Um, we're going to put that link in the website in the chat box right now. And then, final question um, We talk a lot about the restoration of sensation, and you talk about if the nipple isn't there, it might there might be sensation um, elsewhere in the breast. I meant I heard I think Jocelyn say something. A friend of hers was talking about just wanting to feel her children when she hugged them. So there is some level of of sensation returned. The goal that's the goal when you have the surgery, but of course you know. A breast is just like an arm in some ways and very different from an arm in other ways. Is the level of, of restored sensory feeling just as if someone was touching or is it return at least in different parts close to what it was ahead of time? Does, do you understand what I mean? I mean, okay. Do you want me to take that one? Since... <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, there's, I, I feel like I never missed a gap, if that makes sense, you know, because I was trying to figure out, okay, so if I don't feel anything, what should it feel like? So that in itself, I was like, okay, I guess I'm feeling because I'm questioning what it'd be like to be totally numb. Um, I never, I never, I actually felt tingling, you know, sensation happening in, during my healing process. 
Um, and that's to say, it's not, like I said, it's not every area where I have full, like, I feel like what you're saying under the breast, Dr. Baker, I might not have full sensation. I kind of feel like I'm pushing a stress ball or so I know I'm touching myself, but it's not, you know, the warm tingly feeling you feel when you touch, you know, your hand or your, um, but I definitely feel pressure. I feel touch. I feel if I close my eyes and you stroked your finger, like in the video, I would feel that for sure. Um, so significant, significant, yeah, significant. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. Okay, listen, I want to be respectful of everybody's time. So what I am going to do right now is thank you both so very much for joining us tonight. Um, I learned so much. I hope all of you on screen did as well. I want to thank Resensation, our partner and sponsor on tonight's webinar. Before we close today, I wanna to take the opportunity to share one additional resource with you. At Charcheret, we know that breast surgery recovery can be more comfortable if you have support and comfort items at home. Charcheret offers a free care package for mastectomy recovery, which includes drain holders, a seatbelt cushion, a pillow for your arm so that it's not up against the surgical site, if you are interested in receiving one for your upcoming surgery, please contact us to get your free care package. You can do so in the email that's going to be in the chat box below. You'll also have an opportunity to request it um, on the evaluation sur uh, survey, which of course brings us to the survey. There is a link in the box right now please take a moment to fill it out. Um, it really does inform future, future educational opportunities. And like I said, we'll give you the opportunity, up, it's right up there now, we'll give you the opportunity to order a mastectomy care kit, to, to um, connect with our social workers, things like that. During the next couple of days, you'll receive, uh, early next week, you'll receive a follow-up email with a link to the recording to a transcript, also access to some of the resources we talked about today. Again, the mastectomy care kit, Dr. Banks' beautiful artwork as it surrounds um, reconstruction and mastectomy, um, and the Resensation website so you can locate doctors. Finally, please remember that Char Sherritt is here for you and your loved ones. We provide emotional support, mental health counseling, and other programs designed to help navigate you through your cancer experience, all free, completely private, one-on-one. -on -one. You can reach us at uh, clinical at charcheret.org. Dr. Bank has just put his email in the, in the chat box if you wanted to connect with him. Thank you so much for joining us tonight and have a wonderful evening. Good night. Thank you so much.